I'd like to retell a story that we had in Uplook magazine quite a few years ago about a little girl named Christy. Uh, but before we do that, let me remind you of two very well-known verses. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, Love never fails. And uh, Galatians 5, 6, Faith working by love. This idea that our faith is invisible. People can't see our faith, but they can see the evidence of our love. And so love makes faith visible. And this story is clearly a manifestation of both principles, that through faith, through believing God, uh, they were able to manifest his love in their care, and also the glorious truth that love carries on, love doesn't give up, and in the end, love never fails. So this story, I'm just going to give uh, the substance of it. It's a fairly lengthy story, but uh, it's the story about a young girl, 14 years of age, who gave birth to a baby prematurely, three months early. It was The little baby was less than two pounds, or about just about two pounds. And um, she had to go through a, a bunch of surgeries, I think uh, months of surgeries and interventions. And unfortunately, the oxygen that she needed to keep her alive uh, caused her blindness and, and brain damage. And uh, although um, this 14-year-old girl and her mother took the baby home, they really couldn't give it the care it needed, and uh, it went from bad to worse. But thankfully, the Children's Aid Society uh, rescued the baby, and after, I think, about uh, four years in the institution, uh, they found a foster family to take this little girl. They called her Paula. Well, um, it didn't work out. It was just beyond their capabilities, too. And so the little baby ended up uh, back in, in the care of the institution. And um, this left the child very fragile, bitter, often biting herself and punching herself and temper tantrums. Uh, she wasn't speaking, and um, she was uh, both deaf and blind. And uh, so she would rock herself. She would have hand flapping, uh, self-stimulating. Uh, the little child was just locked in her own body. And um, meanwhile, uh, this was in the, in the province of Manitoba. M meanwhile, over in Ontario, there was a, a couple... And um, the doctor, Rick, was a, uh, an eye doctor who specialized in dealing with multi-handicapped children. And uh, he and his dear wife uh, were very burdened about adopting a, a blind child. Now, they had several of their own children. They had adopted some children. They had foster-parented many children. And uh, But they felt God wanting them, because of his expertise especially, uh, to adopt a blind child. And uh, there was a, an article every week in their local newspaper called Today's Child. And it would tell about hard-to-adopt children. And so one week it featured this little seven-year-old girl and uh, said that she was both deaf and blind and, and they really believed God answered their prayer in this, and they wanted to adopt this child. Well, they found out that actually the child was not anywhere nearby. Uh, where they lived to where the child was was about 1,500 miles. They flew out there, and uh, I remember uh, Georgie, the wife, telling me how uh, she had made a special little doll with all different kinds of material so that um, the little girl could feel the difference between all these different types of material. And she was very hopeful and looking forward to uh, receiving this child. But when they got there, they were taken back into a darkened room. And, uh, and she writes, Paula sat cross-legged on an inner tube, rocking wildly. She was skin and bone. Her face was black and blue from self-abuse. My heart sank when I saw her and I felt afraid. She talks about um, bringing this doll over to this little girl 
and rebuffing her and finally taking it and throwing it in the corner. But the doctor came over and uh, he began humming a little tune and uh, he took his fingers and walked his fingers up uh, until he got up to her face and he tweaked her nose and she smiled and put out her arms. Well, the, the staff immediately called them out of the room and said that was cute and everything, but you know, this child is really beyond a family care. Uh, this child is going to have to be institutionalized the rest of her life. And and uh, they said, well, we really believe God wants us to take this little child. And they were both highly qualified. And so they said, well, it'll probably be the end of your marriage. Oh, they said, we don't think so. Uh, we're looking to the Lord to, to help us through this. And so uh, in the end, they were able to bring uh, this little girl home. And um, uh, it was a very tough time for them. She would curl in the fetal position, lie on the floor. She would cry. It seemed that uh, it turned out that she actually wasn't deaf. They could tell this because uh, she would she would cry when um, there was the washing machine running or the or the vacuum cleaner or crying babies, and she would lie there and cry. And they realized she could hear, but she had actually blocked out the world. Well. As uh, Georgie writes, Paula began to blossom before our eyes as she responded to her love for her. Her countenance changed, the wild rocking and hand flapping stopped. We never saw the biting, scratching, or tantrums. She began to learn language. And uh, as, as time went by, she, she began to, to sing. Uh, the, the hymns, and she could memorize scripture. And um, she, she never initiated conversation, but she would respond to them. And, um, and eventually, uh, they, they became quite concerned. They, they renamed her Paula Christie Joy, little joyful Christian, with their hope that Christie would somehow understand that she was a sinner who needed a savior. And they didn't know how this would happen because she didn't go out on her own. She didn't initiate conversations. She couldn't see. And, and so they wondered how, how could she, the Spirit of God convince her of this. And um, so one day, um, one of their own uh, daughters was uh, teaching, giving Christy a piano lesson. And um, she was having a hard time at the lesson. And after the lesson, she went over and sat, and she was very sad looking, and Georgie went over and put her arm around her and sat quietly, and, and for once, Christy initiated the conversation. And she said, oh, she, she always talks of herself in, in the third person, she. And uh, she says, um, uh, Mommy, did she press a little hard on the piano keys when Katie was teaching her how to play the piano? She was convicted that she had lost control, that she had expressed her frustration by, by hitting the keys too hard. And uh, um, Georgie answered, I don't know, honey, did you do that? Yes, mummy. Her head hung even lower. Mummy, should she pray and tell God she's sorry and ask God to forgive her? I answered, would you like to do that, Christy? Immediately, she said, yes. God? She pressed a little hard on the piano keys when Katie was teaching her how to play the piano. She's very sorry. Would you please forgive her? And then you can think happy thoughts, and she can think happy thoughts. Amen. Georgie writes, her little face beamed with joy. My eyes filled with tears because I knew she understood God's forgiveness. What an amazing thing this is. This delicate little soul, how gently the gracious spirit worked in her heart to bring her to realize that she too needed a savior there's a little aside to the story, and, and it's worth it just to listen for a, a few minutes more. 
while they thought that Christie was still deaf as well as blind, um, uh, Georgie had, had invested all her time and energies into this little girl, hardly left her alone for years. And uh, eventually, uh, Rick said to her, you know, you're going to have to take some time off. You need to take a little break. And there was a Woman Alive conference coming to the area. Why don't you go to the conference, take the day off, spend some time with the sisters, and, and you know, recover. And um, uh, so she agreed. And she went in the morning. And uh, then uh, she came home at lunch. And Rick said, look, everything's fine. Christy's happy. I washed the floor. Uh, well, go on back. And so she went back for the afternoon. But what, by the time she got there, the, uh, the, the next session had already started. And so going up and down, finally she found a seat beside two older ladies. Well, she had hardly seated herself when the speaker said something like, you know, it's possible to come to a conference with hundreds of people like this and never actually meet anyone, never engage in personal conversation. So I'd like everyone just to take a few minutes right now and talk to the people beside you and find out what's going on in their life and, and so on. And so she began talking to these two older ladies. And she began to tell about uh, this little girl and how God had used them to rescue her and how he had saved this little girl. And, uh, and they were fascinated. And they said, not Melissa. She said, no, her name's not Melissa. And then she remembered, you know, when they wrote that article in the newspaper about her, they had used a different name uh, to, to disguise, to give her anonymity, and they had indeed called her Melissa. And she said, well, yes, actually, I guess it is Melissa. And here they were from a, a, a local assembly on the other side of Toronto, and she was from Brantford. And they had met at this conference, and they were sitting side by side. And they said, we saw the story of Melissa in the newspaper, and we began to pray that a Christian family would adopt her. And there was a couple in our local church who tried to adopt her, and they said they were too old. And so we prayed that God would use a Christian family to take this little girl. Can you imagine the God of heaven arranging for one seat beside these two older ladies so that these ladies could discover that God had answered their prayer through the Wiggins and that God in his grace manifested to Georgie as she sat there how he had been working before they ever and uh, became involved in actually getting this little girl that God had prepared the way and that there were people who had been praying insistently for this little girl all the time. I tell you, folks, if you can't trust a God like that, if you can't love a God like that, your heart must be stone. Thank God. Love never fails and faith works by love.